Hey everybody, so in this lecture we're going to talk about resonance as it applies to standing waves. Now, this video over here shows us what a standing wave looks like. Essentially what we have is we've got one wave that's moving forward, right? So this green wave is moving forward, and then it's hitting this surface here, and then it's bouncing off, and the blue wave is the wave that it looks like when it's reflected backwards. So the wave is going, it's hitting a surface, and then it's being reflected back, right? Now, the, the red wave, of course, is the combination of the two, right? And the wave does look like it's standing. The, the wave looks like it's not moving. Of course, it, it, it's the result of two waves that are moving, or really one wave that's being reflected, but this is why we call it a standing wave, right? And of course, if you notice something interesting about this wave is it's got two different types of points. It's got points, uh, and I'm speaking about the red wave now in particular, it's got points that are, appear to be fixed. So like here, these appear to be fixed. They don't move. And these are what we call nodes. These are what we call nodes, right? They're nodes because they don't move. And we've got another one over here, got another one over here, another one over here, uh, and so on and so forth, right? These are points that don't move. And then we've got antinodes. And antinodes are points that uh, have the maximal displacement. So for example, this is an antinode over here, right? This is another one, right? It goes from all the way up to all the way down and uh, so on and so forth, right? And the final point I wanna make here as far as this goes is that if we notice the reflection point, the reflection point here appears to be, uh, it appears to be a node, right? So this is a node, right? And so that's also important. And same thing with the starting point actually is also a node. Now, when we talk about standing waves, they, they generally can occur in, uh, in tubes. And, and there are two different kinds of tubes that we can have a standing wave in. So I'm gonna zoom in here so that we can do a nice graph. So we can have a tube that is open at both ends, right? So for example, this tube here is open at both ends. Um, and this would be analogous to, and let me actually go ahead and write that. Open, and actually let me write it above so that I have space here. Open at both ends. And this would be somewhat analogous to a flute, right? A flute, of course, you blow in uh, from the top, typically, right? And uh, it is open at both ends. It appears to be uh, open at both ends, right? Now, of course, the way that a flute works is a little bit different, but it's, uh, you know, a, fl a flute functions in this manner, right? Contrast that with a clarinet, for example, and a clarinet. So let's go ahead and draw another one of these tubes. And a clarinet is going to appear as though it is closed on one end. And that's kind of the way the part that we uh, blow from, the, the, the reed on the clarinet, is closed. And so that's going to result in different, uh, or different properties for the standing waves that are in each of these systems. So let's start with a tube that is open at both ends. Now if we zoom in on this tube over here, so let's zoom in on it, and we see that this tube is going to be able to support uh, a certain number of different kinds of waves. And we see that a wave in this tube is going to have two requirements, right? It's gonna to have to have an antinode on both ends. So antinode, and let's switch back to the white for a second. Antinode here, and an antinode here. And those, that's really the only requirement. And so from that, we want to figure out what's the smallest, or what's the simplest, I guess, wave that we can fit inside of this tube. And really the simplest wave is one that does this. And so what this wave is doing is it's starting at an antinode and it's ending at an antinode, right? Now, the next wave up, and I'll, I'll explain what we're doing here in a second. Um, and I think it'll start to become a little bit more clear as we make more waves, right? But the second wave we're gonna draw is going to also start at this antinode. It's going to peak about here, and then it's gonna get back down. Let me fix that. And it might look something like that. Right, that's the second simplest wave that we can draw. And again, the requirement is that it has to have an antinode at both ends. And then 
Uh, the third way we're going to draw, so what's the third simplest way we can draw? Well, again, it has to start at the antinode. Oop, that's a little bit too big. And again, it has to start at the antinode. And it's going to do something like this. And so again, we started and ended at antinodes for all of these. Notice it doesn't actually matter whether it's uh, an antinode up or down. All that matters is that we have to have an antinode uh, at both ends. And so these are the three sm simplest or smallest, uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, waves that we can create in a tube that's open at both ends. And it turns out these are also what we would call harmonics for these given tubes, right? So these are what we call harmonics. And uh, the simpler, as so as we go from simpler to more complex, uh, we go from uh, the first harmonic to, in this case, the third harmonic. So let me actually go ahead and label them. So this yellow is the first harmonic. The orange was the second harmonic. I was going to write orange. That's right. And this purple was the third harmonic. And I realized I changed the color. I made it so it's a little bit easier to read because the other font, I think, is a little bit more difficult. And so let's say I wanted to figure out what are the wavelengths of these waves. Right? I want to figure out the wavelengths of these waves. And I don't just want to figure them out in terms of like a measurement. I want to figure out them out in terms of uh, relative to the length of the tube. So let's say this, the length of this tube, and in, in a context of like a clarinet or a flute in this case, this would be uh, the length of the, the flute, right? This would be L, right? So this distance is L. And I want to figure out what is the wavelength of each of these harmonics in terms of L. Right? And it turns out there is an equation for this. So I'll show you the equation first, and I'll show you then why the equation uh, makes sense. But first, I'm going to move these labels. I'm going to move them over here. And I realize they're not, they don't correspond anymore. So let me go ahead and move this. All right, and so the equation for the wavelength is going to be, so the wavelength, we're going to use this color is equal to 2L, and L is that green, so let me actually switch that with green. Over N. Let's fix that, make sure it looks like an N. Where N is the number of the harmonic. And so let me show you why that makes sense. All right, let's take a look at that first harmonic first. So for the first harmonic, We'll do the wavelength for 1. It's going to be equal to, well, if we were to plug in 1 for n, we just end up with 2L. And what that means is that the wavelength of the first harmonic is double the length of the tube. And that makes sense. Let me show you why that makes sense. Because if we were to extend out this wave, it would do something like this, right? And so we see that this, of course, would be one wavelength over here, right? We start and end at the same position. So it's one full cycle of the wave. And that would require a second, uh, a second tube. So we see that uh, that the wavelength of the of the wave is double the length of the tube. So therefore, it's two L, and that makes sense, right? Now let me erase that. And what's the wavelength of the second harmonic? And that's going to be equal to two L divided by two, which is just going to be L, right? Mathematically, two times L divided by two. All the twos would cancel out, and we would end up with L, right? And that makes sense here, because if we look at this wave, we see that it starts and ends at the same points, and that means that the wave is just one full wavelength, right? So the wavelength is identical to the length of the tube. And then finally, let's take a look at that third harmonic, and that's going to be equal to 2L over 3, or 2 thirds L. So 2 thirds L, right? And that makes sense as well, right? We see that this is one full wavelength of the, of the wave, right? And then we've got a bit left over. So this would be one third of L, this would be two thirds of L, and then this would be the third third of L. So it's, so the wavelength is two thirds of L. So I just wanted to show you why conceptually kind of that, that makes sense, but then also mathematically the formula really is the way that we can more precisely determine 
uh, what we're doing. And we could keep adding uh, harmonics. So we only did the first three, but we could keep going and we could just use the equation to figure out what the wavelength would be. Um, but of course, if we wanted to draw it out, we could also draw it out. So again, so let me write this here. N is equal to one comma two, three dot dot dot. All right, so we could keep going. By the way, the first harmonic is very special. It's also called the fundamental harmonic. So this is the fundamental fundamental wavelength or the fundamental frequency. All right, so these are wavelengths that we're calculating here, but we could just as easily plug in wavelengths into the equation fundamental. All right, so again, fundamental wavelength or fundamental frequency, which we could derive from the wavelength. Now I want to show you what it would look like if we were dealing with a wave or a, sorry, a tube that is closed at one end. So in the case of a wave that is closed at one end, or sorry, a tube that's closed at one end, we're going to deal with this, right? So in this case, once again, we've got an antinode at this end, right? Since it's, the string is not fixed at all, the wave isn't fixed, it can kind of just bounce up and down. Right, so it's an antinode. But here, because this is a closed surface, um, it's fixed, right? So it's going to be a node. So the wave is not going to oscillate on this end, right? So the wave is always going to just hang out here, right? And so that's going to have implications for what our harmonics are going to look like. And let me go ahead and draw them out. Or should I show you the equation first? Maybe I should show you the equation first. I'll show you the equation, but then I'll draw it out, and then we'll talk about why the equation applies. So the equation wavelength for a given harmonic, n, is equal to 4L over n. And I'll show you in a moment that there's something special about this equation. But let's start with the simplest wave that we can draw here. And the simplest wave where we've got one antinode and one node, uh, and this is going to look kind of funny, it's going to look something like this, right? All right, and I'll show you again mathematically in a second what that's going to look like. Now the second one, which we did in orange last time, is going to look like this. And it's gonna look something like that. And I'll show you in a second why mathematically, uh, why that works. And then for the next harmonic, so again, as we said, the next simplest wave, the next simplest wave where we can have an anti-node at one end and a node at the other end, it's going to look like this. Something like this. And let's go ahead and see mathematically what we're dealing with here. All right, so again, let me go ahead and label them. So we've got the first harmonic, which is over here. And interestingly, we're actually not going to we're going to skip the second harmonic. So it turns out with this type of a tube, we can only have uh, odd numbered harmonics. So this is actually the third harmonic, and that's going to make this one the fifth harmonic. And so mathematically, let's go ahead and see what we're doing. The wavelength of the, let's start with the first. The first harmonic, which remember we call the fundamental, is equal to 4L divided by 1, and that's just 4L, so 4L. And let's see why or how that makes sense. So it turns out that if we were to zoom out a lot and we were to really extend this wave out, then we would see that this is only one quarter of a wavelength, because if we were to keep going, we would end up with another uh, another way of doing this, and let me fix that. So doing something like that, and then it would do that. And so we would actually need four more of this length to get a full wavelength. And um, I didn't really do it too well, but you understand the point. Actually, it would have to be much longer. It would have to be like this. Something like that, right? So again, this is only one quarter of the wavelength in this tube, and that means that the full wavelength of uh, of the first harmonic is going to have to be 4L, or four times the length of the tube, right? And again, we skip the odd-numbered harmonics, or we skip the even, sorry, we're only dealing with odd numbers, so 
the wavelength of the third harmonic is going to be equal to 4 thirds L. And that also makes sense. And let me show you why that makes sense. Because if we were to, if we were to extend out this, we would do something like this. And so it turns out that we would end up with about 4 thirds of L. So this would be about 4 thirds L. All right, let me go ahead and erase that. And then the fifth harmonic is going to be equal to, of course, 4 fifths L. And that makes sense, right? The wavelength here, this is about 4 fifths of the tube. And so it's 4 fifths L. And so, again, from a mathematical standpoint, let me go ahead and write out here that N is equal to 1, 3, 5, dot, dot, dot. So meaning that we're only dealing with odd numbered harmonics, unlike for the closed or sorry, the open at both ends, we're dealing with uh, all the numbers here. Let me go ahead and write what type of tube this is closed at one end. We are dealing with only the odd numbered harmonics. And so when you're looking, for example, at a violin string or a wind instrument, it turns out that they're primarily going to vibrate at their fundamental frequency, at their first harmonic. And they could also uh, achieve higher harmonics depending on the way the instrument is manufactured. And I'm not an expert in instruments, so let's leave it at that. But so these harmonics, and if we were to plug in these wavelengths, we could get what we would call resonance frequencies. These would tell us the wavelength or the frequency at which something would vibrate, something uh, would resonate. And so, for example, there's a very famous bridge uh, called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington, where when the wind hit it at a precise, at the precisely right frequency, when the wind was moving fast enough, uh, the bridge actually started vibrating at its resonance frequency. Right, so it started going up and down and up and down, um, and then the bridge actually broke. Not because the wind was too strong, because of course the bridge was designed to handle wind, uh, but the, because the bridge uh, was actually moving at its resonance frequency, and so the bridge wasn't designed to handle that. All right, so that's what we want to talk about here for harmonics and resonance. For the MCAT, for the most part, I think these problems are not going to be too difficult, as long as you have an understanding of what we talked about here, and you've got an understanding of the equations that I mentioned here, right, for an open at both ends tube and a tube that is closed at one end. And so that's all we want to talk about here for harmonics and resonance for the MCAT.